right, so we'll continue uh, speaking about the ecclesiastical faith, and I promised that we speak about Molina, so there it comes. So remember uh, quickly, what is the difference between uh, ecclesiastical faith and divine faith in the concept of theologians who use that notion? Uh, let me see, Christian. Right. I mean, it's not the only thing. Like it's it virtually revealed, so that will include uh, theological conclusions, but it will also include what what else? Truth, canonization, Christoph. Uh, encyclicals is just a form of, of a document. Like it, it, you can have things that are revealed, and things, and also you might have a lot of theological conclusions in it. That's true, but it's more like a form of document. Um, with the Jansenist, what what happened? What was Nico? Dramatic facts. facts, right? Things like that, and then we saw also approval of religious orders, things like that. Uh, so the uh, we we left on page uh, two ninety four. Uh, the the first paragraph, I suppose, uh, after the footnote uh, twelve there. So we said, uh, we explained that uh, the Bishop Ardouin de Perefix, he used that distinction to uh, basically answer the objection of a Jansenist and make them accept the decision of a church. Uh, so then he, uh, that, that is taken from Marine, uh, Marine Sola. Uh, Monsignor Fenton is summarizing the argument of Marine Sola and uh, explaining that he had a number of professors of theology of the Sorbonne that he gathered together for a conference and basically discu discussed the matter with them in order to, uh, to, to know what to do or what to say to, to the Jansenists. And that's where it seems, that's where he got that idea of uh, ecclesiastical faith. And uh, so we, we just left there. And then you will see that um, Marine Sola traces that uh, to Molina. So that's where we are now. As for the concept of a merely ecclesiastical faith as distinct from the expression itself, for, so the idea, that means basically Molina would not necessarily use the word ecclesiastical faith, but the idea, however, the notion, uh, Father Marine Sola was able to trace it clearly expressed back as far as the early 17th century writings of Granados and Becanus. So in those, in the works of these theologians, you will find something equivalent. Again, they won't speak about ecclesiastical faith, but they would basically explain, explain the same thing. It, up, it appeared in theological literature as the development of a somewhat singular teaching put forward by the great Luis de Molina, uh, Jesuit, towards the end of the 16th century. And the only time you hear about Molina is when you do De Grazia, obviously. <laughs> and uh, so at the end of De Grazia, you don't have a great esteem of Molina, I would say that, but in any case, uh, he still calls him the great. So he might have written things that are all right. You know, He might have been a great preacher. He might have been very good with teaching kids how to serve mass, things like that. Uh, but as far as grace was concerned, uh, he was kind of a disaster, in my opinion. But in any case, Molina had contended as the first to propose this teaching, according to Faber Marin Sola, that a truth which is properly a theological conclusion can never be proposed or defined by the church as a dogma of a Catholic faith. So here, again, we have the same idea. He does not use the term fides ecclesiastica that we had here, but it's the same idea, that it cannot get to the point of divine and Catholic faith. Somewhat, somehow. He was convinced that the truth which was properly a conclusion deduced from revealed datum retained that status even after the infallible pronouncement of the church itself. Once the church had spoken, uh, there were two ways in which the individual Catholic sh could accept this teaching. First, by the use of a deductive process which the church itself had employed in arriving at this conclusion. And second, by the use of the following syllogism, the church cannot err in its definitions. This or that proposition is defined, therefore it is certain and true. So here you have uh, the reference in the work of Molina. Molina held that the first process, the use of a deductive process, which the church itself had employed, 
was available only to theologians within the church. Basically, you would have to understand the theology behind it. Um, so, as you know, that it's not accessible to everybody. The general syllogism showing the acceptability of any conclusion defined by the church as a true and certain statement was, in his opinion, within the competence of all the faithful. To think the church teaches that, therefore, must be true. The concept of a strictly and merely ecclesiastical faith took final shape, however, in the writings of uh, James Granados. I hope I say it right. Uh, wh what, why is it James as in, like, written like that? I guess he's Spanish, right? Spanish. Jaime. Jaime? That's the way you say it. <laughs> so, but it's not supposed to be said James, right? Jaime, okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Jaime Granados. What does it mean? Uh, what, what's the equivalent in English? James. It's James? Jaime. Okay. What about Jacobo then? Okay, okay, all right, thank you. All right, so Jaime Granados, one of the defenders of Molina, he wrote as follows, and this is taken from his work, as you see here, also commentary on St. Thomas Actually, There are two ways in which a man can ascend to these propositions, meaning the theologic, uh, theological conclusions, defined by the church. One way is by deducing them from the revealed principles as the council or the pontiff have done. The man who ascends in this way elicits an act of theology <laughs> to which the asc this ascent belongs. An act of theology, I mean, what? It's like a virtue or something. The other way is to ascend without any discursive process, but by reason of the authority of the church itself. This is the act which is usually elicited not only by the unlearned in sacred theology, but also by experts in this field such as Molina Poli, he would say. <laughs> Still, this is not elicited by means of an act of divine faith, as we have said. Uh, nor is it elicited by means of the habitus of theology, since it is not discursive. So if you yourself were to prove the point, uh, for example, that one communion under one species is okay, you would deduce that from theology, you would do an act of theology. Never saw that in a prayer book, but that's all right. And <laughs> like act of faith, act of uh, hope, and then act of theology. I adhere to the thesis, or oh, act of theology. <laughs> uh, it belongs, however, to a kind of most uh, certain human faith because it is based on the infallible authority of a church. Faith of this kind is easily observed in the unlearned, as uh, is that other by which they believe that those whom the pontiff lists in the number of the saints are actually resting in the Lord and are really enjoying the beatific vision. Martin Becanus distinguished three different kinds of faith. Was, uh, one was true divine faith in which a man ascends to a proposition on the authority of God who has revealed it. So you read the gospel, you see that our Lord multiplied the fish and the uh, loaves. You believe that, that's an act of divine faith. Another is merely human faith, exemplified by the ascent which a heretic might give to some teaching on the authority of Luther or Calvin. Or well, human faith, I mean, <laughs> I don't know why he gives the... the uh, Example of Luther and Calvin, but also human faith is just, uh, for example, if I tell you, yes, in Canada, uh, whatever, I do this and that, you will believe me, right? I, at least I hope. And that's human faith. Okay? You saw that in uh, criteriology in principle. The third is neither purely divine nor purely human, but as it were, midway between these. It is belief in or acceptance of some teachings on the authority of the church. So you see, it's the exact same doctrine. Uh, Father Marin Sola asserts that Becanus, uh, is that the right way to say it? Uh, it's not Spanish? You sure? <laughs> okay, all right. I don't know. Becanus, anyway, who died 40 years before the issuance of Archbishop de Perefix instruction, was one of the favorite authors of those Sorbonne theologians who were, with their arch Archbishop, responsible for the appearance of the term ecclesiastical faith. In the literature of Catholic th theology, okay. And it is manifest from even a superficial study of the history of Catholic theology that the notion of a certain and absolutely firm acceptance of Catholic teachings motivated by the authority of the Church and not by the authority of God as the revealer became accepted during the 18th and 19th centuries. So it's, it, it does come from this period. The thing is, are they really the ones who you know, made it public uh, for the first time, whatever it seems? But in any case, it is true to say it appeared at that time 
uh, it is true to say that you find it in the writings of Molina and, and his disciples. So it clearly comes from there. Um, you know, but then who really is the first one to have thought about it? Well, it doesn't really matter anyway. In combating the objective validity of his notion, Faber Marine Sola made use of some interesting arguments. He employed 11 dis distinct demonstrations to support his conclusion that all the truths accepted as completely certain by reason of a church's teaching are believed with an act of genuine divine faith. Several of these demonstrations are taken from the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas. Some of them apply directly to theological conclusions, while others have reference to all the truths classified as within the secondary object of a church's infallible magisterium. Out outstanding among these proofs are those uh, based upon the following contentions. So, obviously, that's a selection from uh, Monsignor Fenton. Those are the ones he likes. Number one, there is no such thing as an infallibly certain and true faith other than that which, uh, that which is based on the authority of God. That makes sense. Otherwise, what is it? I mean, the, the church is infallible only to discern the deposit of faith, not to anything else. And only in proposing what God has revealed, not in deciding herself new things. So it, it's a good argument. Second, what is revealed mediately or virtually is truly something spoken by God. It is an, an explanation of his teaching. Uh, so he, we are going to, to develop that a little more, but we already said that yesterday that when we do the, the little drawing there, to say that at least some of it is, is included in, uh, in formal revelation. Third, the man who denies obstinately a truth proposed infallibly by the church is a heretic, and the sin of heresy necessarily involves a contradiction of the divine message itself. So, at least for the theological conclusions, many times uh, they are just under an anathema in the Council of Trent, for example. Well, communion under one species, that's a good example. It's condemned by an anathema if you disagree with, uh, with that. So... Uh, fourth, the infallible teaching of a church cannot propose any new doctrine, but only an explanation of a deposit of public divine revelation. That's a very good argument. The validity of the third uh, of, uh, of the reasons I have just mentioned has been brought out with special clarity in a recent and very valuable book, which incidentally defends the concept of a merely ecclesiastical faith. And he refers to this book here. Father Sisto Cartecchini in his brilliant work, De Valore Notarum Theologicarum, lists as the censures applicable to a contradiction of a teaching, De Fide Ecclesiastica Definita, so you can take the, uh, the copy that you have at the table to have that on the side and look. All right, so uh, we look at the censure, De Fide Ecclesiastica Definita, uh, the qualification of anath uh, an anathema or anathematization, and of heresies circa fidem ecclesiasticam. Or heresies contra fidem ecclesiasticam, I guess it's the same. The same distinguished author uh, holds that the censures applicable to a teaching that contradicts a dogma of the faith are the qualifications of anathematization and uh, heresies circa fidem divinam. Contra again. So. I do not believe that there can be any serious quarrel with Thayer Cartekini on this matter. It would seem that the basic reason that constituted the Jansenists as, as uh, heretics was their refusal to accept the authoritative and infallible decision of a sovereign pontiff about a dogmatic fact. That's a good point. They were, I mean, the Pope did not say, well, all right, it's all right, you know, you disagree with this, but this is only ecclesiastical faith or something. They had to submit. The men of Port, uh, Port Royal claimed that they rejected with uh, the Church the five propositions condemned by Pope Innocent X in the Constitution, cum occasione. What they would not admit, however, was the fact, likewise taught authoritatively and infallibly by the sovereign pontiff, that these propositions expressed teaching actually contained in the book Augustinus. We saw, we saw that before. That refusal gained them the designation of heretics. We'll wait for that noise to go away. Thus, the argument of Father Marin Sola is quite opposite 
uh, if he can show, and uh, as I believe that he has shown, that it is impossible to have the sin of heresy apart from an obdurate contradiction of divinely revealed truth proposed as such by the Catholic Church, he has won his point. And to be, uh, just to give a precision here, um, basically theologians are going to say that you, ca you commit a sin of heresy or not, depending on whether or not they follow uh, the, um, the, the idea of fides ecclesiastica, actually. Uh, sorry, I lost myself. Uh, here. The argument based on the first of the four reasons I have cited as used by Father Marin Sola is obviously powerful. So the first one, the fact that there is no other infallibility. Um, and it would seem ineluctable. That based on the fourth of these reasons is likewise convincing. So the fourth is very linked with it. It's the fact that the church cannot uh, teach infallibly any new doctrine. We quoted the Vatican Council before. Actually, it is substantially the argument based on an appeal to the text of the Vatican Council, there you go, and of the profession of faith of Pope Pius IV. The second of these contentions, however, seems to form the basis not only for proof, but also for highly acceptable statement or exposition of Father Marin Sola's teaching. So the f let's lo look back at the second. It was, what is revealed immediately or virtually is truly something spoken by God. So this needs an explanation. In the last analysis, if statements state set forth in an authoritative and infallible manner by the magisterium of the Catholic Church are to be accepted on divine faith, it can only be by reason of the fact that God himself has taught these truths. And in order to see how a teaching like a dogmatic fact can really enter and has really entered into the fabric of divine public revelation, we must carefully examine the very nature of the revealed message itself. Always adverting to the fact that we are using the term spoken analogously, though not metaphorically, so it's a true analogy, we must remember that divine public, public revelation is a spoken message. Formally considered, it is the locutio dei ad homines per modum magisteri. And she takes that from Garrigou Lagrange, you see? This is how you know Monsignor Fenton is good. He quotes Garrigou Lagrange when he has to define something. God spoke of all to the fathers in the prophets, and he has spoken to us in his son. Quoting St. Paul is very good, too. <laughs> uh, and this verse is used by the Vatican Council. This teaching was handed over or delivered by the apostles to the church. They handed it over through the process of teaching it. The message thus delivered, Traditio Divino Apostolica, has been taught continuously by the church since the church received it and will be taught authoritatively and infallibly by the church militant of the New Testament until the end of time. Now the church does this work as a living and infallible teacher. It acts as an infallible teacher by reason of the fact that through the continuing assistance of the Holy Ghost, it presents that divine mes uh, message inherently. It acts as a living teacher insofar as it presents this truth effectively to the faithful in every age and in every part of the world. As a teaching agency, the church, a mystical body of Jesus Christ, acts as the intimately conjoined instrument of our Lord who dwells within it and rules over it. And here he refers to another article of Monsignor Fenton, which uh, is in the book, which I don't know where the book is, uh, here. It's, it's here, but you can also find it in the American Ecclesiastical Review. Christ, the teacher, and the stability of Catholic dogma. It's pretty good. It's a good article. Uh, the church, with our Lord himself within it, acts as a true teacher and not as a mere repetitor. So that's the point that I was making the other day, that the church is infallible in proposing revelation. And for that, she, the church is not just repeating the gospel. Oh, St. Paul says this. No. She actually explains what it means. She acts like a teacher. Okay, so she's able to use words <laughs> to express herself. And therefore she's able to understand what a student would ask, I mean, if we were to take that analogy. It's like, oh, does that mean that? Uh, no, boom, condemn. The teacher is like, yeah, no, no, but uh, uh, no, <laughs> you're wrong, okay? So just like a teacher can do that. So the church also is able to say, what you are saying is wrong. And is the, the student might be like, no, 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 I didn't mean, yes, you did. <laughs> So the, the church can do it. So the church, okay, is not a mere repetitor. It is the function of a teacher to understand and to recognize the doctrines he is commissioned to set forth. At least, I mean, I try my best. It is likewise the work of a teacher to answer questions about the meaning of a doctrine he is engaged in presenting. Questions? <laughs> 
The church then would not be a living teacher of a divine message if it could not recognize a contradiction to that message in some oral or written declarations. It would not be a living and infallible teacher unless it could assert definitiv uh, definitely and infallibly that some of the statements in, uh, in its teaching were contradicted in a defini uh, definite book. Such was the case when Pope Innocent X condemned five propositions contained in the book Augustinus by the bishop Jansenius, who, by the way, you know, he died before that became a controversy. Do you know that? So he wrote a book, he died as a Catholic, and it's only his disciples who took his book and began to spread his doctrines and made a mess. So he was not one of the Jansenists, actually, Jansenius, in the sense that <laughs> obviously he's the, the origin of the doctrine, but he died just before the, the controversy. Such was also the case when Pope Alexander VII declared and defined that, uh, the fact that, quote, the five propositions were taken from the book entitled Augustinus and written by the aforesaid Cornelius Jansenius, Bishop of Ypres, and that they were condemned in the sense intended by that same Jansenius. End quote. If the church's teaching power was not competent to make that infallible declaration, then the church itself would not have been a living and effectively infallible teacher of God's revealed message. And in the final uh, analysis, the declarations of the church on the subject of this dogmatic fact were nothing else than parts of the process of setting forth God's revealed message as a living and infallible teacher. Do you understand that? Again, the church can use, she can express herself saying what, the revelation means, but sh she can also analyze a text and say if it's correct or not. Obviously, it's the same, it's the same thing, obviously, right? It makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. So Marine Solar has a, a great point here. Likewise, the, the church is able to answer questions about the meaning or the import of the message which God has confided to it. The theologian can answer these questions, though obviously not in an infallible manner through the use of the theological proof. When the church feels that the proper time has come, it is competent to answer those questions definitively and infallibly if it wishes to do so. The definitive and infallible answers to the Catholic Church in this particular field are those theological truths which are classified as within the secondary object of the church's infallible magisterium. I'm thinking, uh, I was thinking just uh, Sacramentum Ordin is, um, probably f will fall into that category as well, that the church is able to determine, okay, this is going to be the matter on the form of the sacrament. What is revealed is that you had holy orders, and you can see imposition of hands in the Acts of the Apostle, it's true, and, and certain things, but to define it precisely, the church can do it with that authority. Um, because it's a living magisterium, again. So it's not just repeating, but it's actually making sense of what it, it conveys. These truths are taught by the church and should be received by the faithful as part of the process of teaching the revealed message itself. So that's against people who want you to just quote, 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 quote. <laughs> no thinking, quote. <laughs> that's not how you live the faith. As a living and infallible teacher, the church is certainly competent to judge and to recognize that a definite, uh, definite man has exemplified in his own life, so there we go into canonization, uh, the following of the divine message. So analyze, uh, 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 making an analysis sorry, of the life of a man, she's able to say, oh, yes, this is exactly what you should do. The church, with the assistance of the indwelling Holy Ghost and with the aid of the divine signs or miracles which God deigns to attach to the cause of this man, can infallibly declare him a saint in the performance of its task of teaching the divine message. So you see, what uh, the, the link with canonization is that the church is able to, to say, oh yes, right, you did well. A, a little bit like, uh, again, the teacher will correct the exam and say, oh yes, you did very well. Bloop. A. That's part of being a teacher, right? So the church also can do that with saints. A, A plus. Uh, furthermore, by reason again of its competence to act as a living and infallible teacher of divine public revelation, the church can recognize the suitability or non-suitability of a rule of life 
calculated to lead its children to the heights of sanctity. So here is uh, an allusion to the definitive approval of religious orders. Again, the church can look at a rule and say, yes, this is perfectly in accordance with the gospel. If you do that, you go to heaven. The church is able to do that. Again, it's like a, you know, a teacher reading some things. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, you did a very good uh, summary of the, the class. That's very good. A+. Plus. Speaking about which, uh, we have to think about the exams uh, soon because uh, we finished the magisterial, so I mean, we're close to the end. So I'm just saying that so you can think about it, prepare yourself psychologically. It won't be tomorrow or the day after, but it's coming. Thus, the church, in the course of teaching the divine message, can judge infallibly in the approval of religious orders. In every case, the key principle is the same. The church teaches and acts as a living and infallible teacher of divinely revealed truth. It translates always correctly and effectively the message which it has received from our Lord through his preaching and that of the apostles so as to bring that message to men of every age and of every culture. Thus, it expresses its divine communication accurately and effectively in the vernacular of every age and of every culture. Uh, so you see that the analogy of teacher is really good because it's not just, we're not, we're not trying to limit the function of a church or the infallibility of a magisterium just to like, oh, well, you know, some category of, of some theological handbook that would not be complete enough. But we're actually using the principle. What is the church? What is the church's magisterium about? So the same thing obviously also will apply with uh, discipline and liturgy. It's the same thing again. It might be more of a practical application, but the same thing. In the accomplishment of this task, it is obviously able to say when this message has been contradicted in a definite way, uh, in a definite book. It is likewise competent to answer questions inevitably connected with the process of preaching the perennial, perennial Christian truth to new peoples and to new civilizations. Always it is engaged in the work of setting forth uh, its one message, the divine teaching revealed through Jesus Christ our Lord. And for the infallible statements of its teaching, the church demands the assent of divine faith. Sometimes, it must be admitted, the arguments adduced against the validity of a notion of a fides ecclesiastica really distinct from fides divina leave something to be desired. So he didn't like too much the, the argument of Bishop Guerra, actually. See, Such is the case, I'm convinced, with the arguments advanced in this direction by Father Guerra de Laurier in his recent work, Dimension de la Foi. So he didn't like too much uh, the argument of Bishop Guerra. Which uh, I will probably, uh, I could give you the, um, the French, but it's a pain for me to translate those things, so I'm not sure I will have time to do that. But maybe I will at least give you his arguments uh, quickly uh, next week. Anyway, such also is the case in the explanation given by the learned editors of Theology Digest in their introduction to Bishop Garcia Martinez's article. So, I mean, that's Monsignor Fenton's opinion. You can agree or disagree, I, I don't care. Uh, the <laughs> <laughs> the following statement is prefixed to the resume of Bishop uh, Garcia Martinez's article in Theology Digest. So this is what uh, they say. Protestants frequently object that Catholic dogma is totally unlike the belief of primitive Christianity. Catholics reply that their doctrine is the growth, the development of a seed planted by the preaching of the apostles. Bishop Martinez maintains that the notion of ecclesiastical faith as an ascent distinct from divine faith renders impossible any explanation of this development of dogma. Yeah, I mean, you have to be careful with the idea of seed, obviously, because I mean, the modernists will say the same. Yeah, it develops, it grows, and whatever, but in the sense of a change of dogma. Uh, yes, Ida? Yeah, but it's not very good either in the sense that, uh, again, the church is not just repeating. It's not just saying, oh, yes, this St. Paul says this in, you know, the episode to the Hebrews, chapter 2, St. Paul. In that case, the church would just be giving Bibles, <laughs> right? No, the church does more than that. It is able to propose a teaching, to present it. So it's not just a, like a, a, a treasure which, uh, you know, is contained, like, oh, look at it, and that's it. We don't. We don't do anything about it. So the, the, the growth or the, the life of, of a tree is not a bad analogy in the sense that it's the same life 
but that extends in the sense that you will extend it to new saints, for example, to new dogmatic facts, to new theological conclusions be deduced. Yes? What is the Latin American saying like uh, atheistic atheism and religious change in the gospel? Uh, he's not too happy with it. No. I would hope you would have got that <laughs> at the end of the article. Uh, he, uh, that's right, in the sense that he, yeah, he doesn't make a definitive, he doesn't take a definitive stance on it, I would say. Uh, and I do the same in the sense that, you know, it, it, I would just say that it's disputed. It seems just like to Monsignor Fenton that it makes a lot more sense to say ah, that's not, it doesn't seem legitimate to make that um, distinction. Uh, the arguments presented in the other side makes a lot of sense to say uh, Fides Ecclesiastica, first of all, the origin of it doesn't look good, Molina, mm. uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, you know, in order to please the Jansenists, mm, mm, that doesn't look too good. And then the arguments against it are pretty strong, I would say that. But at the same time, you have a lot of theologians who actually use that distinction, which is obviously always something you're like, well, maybe, maybe I got something wrong, maybe, you know, uh, unless you are a great theologian and you can really say, this is it, boom. Or unless you, <laughs> see, either, it's like either you know a lot of theology and you are able to say, okay, this is it, and they are completely wrong, or you know zero. That's the also when you also are very categorical about what you say, yeah, typically. Yeah, I'm not kidding. <laughs> so usually the people who know nothing, they would just decide, oh, if he was wrong, a heretic. And they don't. So anyway, uh, Monsignor Fenton is uh, he's basically saying, you know, it, it seems, you, well, I mean, we'll see, look at the conclusion. Let's continue and, and move on. Um, the, the statement that our Catholic dogma or doctrine is the growth or the development of a seed planted by the apostle would seem to be seriously objectionable, obviously, because the seed is being destroyed in order to give a tree. So that's not very good. According to the Vatican Council, the Holy Father has been empowered to teach infallibly not the growth or the development of the primitive Christian teaching, but the revelation delivered through uh, the apostles or the deposit of faith itself. What the church teaches to the faithful in this year of grace, 1953, uh, is not a mere development of a teaching delivered by, to the church by the apostles. It is that very message which has been proposed and guarded infallibly by the Ecclesia Docians since the beginning and will continue to be thus proposed and guarded until the end of time. It is true, of course, that there has been an increase of knowledge of the deposit of faith on the part of the church itself throughout the years. It is the kind of increase which comes to the church as the perpetual teacher of the same divine revelation. As the years go by and as the church accurately and effectively translates that divine message into the vernaculars uh, of uh, divergent peoples and cultures, it is obvious that there must come a, in, a genuine increase in knowledge on the church's own part. The church, through answering the questions raised about the meaning of God's message, has come to know the implications and the consequences of that message much more perfectly over the course of the centuries. But the church never wants us to forget that what it teaches now as God's message is not merely the outgrowth or the development of the original message, it is the original deposit of divine public revelation for which, as a whole and in each one of its parts, the church demands of the faithful acceptance with the absolutely certain assent of divine faith. So there you go. He's more the, obviously he goes uh, to the side of um, not making that distinction of ecclesiastical faith. Uh, he also, I think I mentioned that yesterday, but uh, I gave you the list of his work so you can go and check. But uh, there is an article on the... Um, uh, about the, the commission that studied the case of the Immaculate Conception, basically, and when he studies that, he says, "Look, they were not, you know, they never, com com uh, they never uh, came to a point where they discussed, are you sure this is divine faith or ecclesiastical faith or whatever? They never did that. For them, it, it wasn't even a question. Like, they didn't care about it. So he proves that. So anyway, he has also other writings that are uh, linked with that uh, question, and um, it's very clear. Basically, he takes the side of." Uh, ecclesiastical faith is not a valid uh, notion, but uh, he, you know he he presents both sides because the church is, uh, has not uh, pronounced on that yet. So hopefully one day the church can clarify that. Okay, so uh, do you have any more question on ecclesiastical faith? Well, I hope that covers it. Yes.
Le vet, no, sorry. Well, I would say that it was, it's a, I'm not too sure myself actually, I thought about it as well. But uh, we say that the authority of the church is the authority of Christ, which you would say, okay, he received from God, but it's not exactly the same as God, in the sense that it's in as much as the world is incarnate. So, and that's in this, in as much as he's incarnate, that he's the mediator, in as much as he's incarnate, that he's the savior, in as much as he's incarnate, that he received the mission from God the Father to teach the truth and so forth and so on. So I would rather um, say, first of all, uh, not this maybe the authority of God revealing, but the authority of, of Christ. The authority of the church is the authority of Christ, as Pope Isaac have said, but... Um, Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure how the ecclesiastical faith works then, because if you say it's based on the authority of the church, but not as because the authority of Christ obviously has different applications. So the church, for example, cannot reveal new things, uh, which Christ could obviously. So if you had really the authority of Christ, like Christ does, for example, you would be able to change the sacraments and things like that that the church cannot. So. Um, the authority of the church, it's the authority of Christ, all right, but it's not all of the authority of Christ. So it's it was what it has, basically. I'm trying to think out loud. I mean, I'm not, not too sure what to make of it either. Yes? Yeah, but well, it's a good analogy in the sense that there are certain things that Christ can do and the church cannot, obviously. Uh, so I guess that would be the, the difference here. All right, so I wanted to go over this document as well, uh, but it's quite long, so we might go through it quickly and, and you know go to the main points because I don't want to spend five hours reading that. But uh, before we, we get there, I just wanted to mention the fact that I also have other uh, documents of Monsignor Fendon that already I have uh, already scanned and, and printed out. So uh, if some of you want a copy, then you can ask. Uh, I'm not going to do for everybody because that would be like a, a complete forest of paper. <laughs> but um, so I have, for example, the doctrinal authority of uh, papal allocutions. So if somebody wants to make a copy, you can come and do uh, at the end of class, I'm not now. Infallibility in the encyclicals. The religious assent due to the teachings of papal encyclicals. So the reason why I'm not giving all of you this to you also is because uh, I could actually give it to you as a PDF, perhaps, first of all. And also, uh, it's covered quite, uh, I mean, to, to a great extent in, in that one. So if you have that one, you actually have the essential. I also have the Humani Generis and the Holy Father's Ordinary Magisterium. This is more recent. Basically, he comments, he comments on the part of uh, Humani Generis where Pope Isaac XII says, um, uh, he says, nor must it be thought that what is expounded in encyclical letters does not of itself demand consent, since in writing such letters the popes do not exercise the supreme power of their teaching authority, for these matters are taught with the ordinary teaching authority, of which it is true to say, he who heareth you heareth me, uh, and so forth and so on. Uh, okay, so he's commenting on that um, uh, part of the encyclical Humani Generis of uh, Pope Pius the, the twelve. And um, so it's interesting, anyway. And then you have the bibliography, so you you, you can ch go and check for yourself, you know, in the library, and see if there is something that you want to keep aside. Uh, yes. No, 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 because I don't think they are there. Uh, no, I actually went to the library and scanned it. Because we have all the uh, American Ecclesiastical Review. Here, we ha there is a few here. But also, this book is not very good for copying, just because it does not open as much. The, uh, the um, 
uh, the books that we have in the library are better for that actually. Um, let me see what he has here. <coughs> he has Christ the teacher and the stability of Catholic dogma. And then he has, and I was referring to that last uh, five minutes ago, requisites for an infallible pontifical definition according to the commission of Pope Pius IX. So that's where I'm telling you that they did not make the distinction in ecclesiastical faith or divine faith, whatever. The Humani Generis, uh, okay, so this one is here. Uh, the doctrinal function of the Ecumenical Council, which is quite interesting, um, but he wrote that as a preparation for Vatican II. So the, the poor Monsignor Fenton, he was expecting Vatican II to be Catholic. <laughs> uh, like <laughs> basically, he was very hopeful about it, and you know, and he says he would, he w in his mind, he wanted to prepare people as to what a council is, and you know, what's the function of a council, and all of this. So he, it's true. <laughs> so he issued a number of articles about, you know, how great it's going to be, and um, <laughs> something happened. <laughs> yes. Exactly, after that you see in his diary that uh, he wasn't uh, too enthusiastic about it anymore afterwards. So. Okay, so uh, let's look at uh, the doctrinal authority of papal encyclicals. As I said, it's long and I don't want to f spend five hours, so uh, I'm just going to go through the main points and it's up to you to read the entire thing, okay? But the, the beginning, let's read the beginning though, because it gives a little bit of a history and that's uh, interesting. Since the year 1878, when Pope Leo XIII began to rule as Christ the vicar on earth, over the church militant, over 150 encyclical letters have been issued by the sovereign pontiffs. So, and he's writing that in 1949. Uh, so over uh, 150. I think, if I'm not mistaken already, like Pope Leo XIII, he wrote, if I'm not mistaken, f literally 15 encyclicals on the rosary. <laughs> so uh, he wrote a lot of encyclicals. So that's the rosary, and obviously he did a lot more. Though. These encyclical letters have exercised an incalculably powerful influence in the direction of Catholic teaching and of Catholic life because they are so complete. When you look at church's decision in the past, uh, well, obviously you have... You know, like the Council of Trent, there is a lot of material too, all right? But if you look at uh, papal bulls, for example, on, on, you know, one issue or whatever, it's very short. It's just a definition, basically, and that's it. Uh, but the encyclicals, oh, wow, it's so long. Like, uh, the other day I was reading Mystic Corpus. You could make a book out of it. It's so long and deep. So, and I'm not complaining about that. <laughs> I'm not saying, wow, it's too long. No, but it's very, uh, you have a lot of teaching, which is why uh, when we discuss Catholic doctrine, we always quote encyclicals, because it presents the faith in such a complete manner. It's, it's very impressive. Now we take it for granted because we're just used to it. But again, 200 years ago, you didn't have all of this. So it's a, it's a very great uh, means, powerful way of, of teaching. I had a book and I, I don't know where I put it, it's not here, but I had a book who gave the history of the, uh, unless I don't know, uh, the history of the encyclical in, in more details and I think the first encyclical, you could call that way, was actually Pope St. Zephyrinus, which is in the early church. He sent a letter to all the bishops, uh, so that was the idea of an encyclical. But then you have to pretty much go up to uh, Benedict XIV, so in the 18th century, to again have something similar that resembled that a little bit. And then uh, Pope Pius IX did a few, but then it's really Leo XIII that made it like the favorite way of teaching the church. Leo XIII is the one that really made it what it is now. Uh, appearing as they have at an average rate of one in a little less than six months, these documents have come to be recognized as the most frequently used vehicles of the Holy Father's ordinary teaching of a flock entrusted to his care. So you see that it's quite recent, right? Because he's saying since the year 1878. The reason I'm pointing this out is because a lot of theological manuals do not even speak about encyclicals, <laughs> which is a little bit confusing at the beginning because you're looking for, okay, what to make of encyclicals, and you're like, ah, he doesn't even speak about it. <laughs> You know, and a lot of uh, theologians do not speak about it. So you have to, um, uh, you know, look for it, and you have to look in in, in more recent uh, theology manuals to actually find, you know, a study on it because they don't speak about it. They don't say what to make of it. 
So this is uh, what he says even in, in his time, in uh, 1949. Despite their manifest and unique importance, however, the paper encyclicals have never been given anything like a completely adequate treatment of the in the literature of sacred theology. So, so he says that there are some who... Uh, uh, he says some of the textbooks used in our seminaries today give no special consideration, whatever, to the doctrinal authority of these documents. In a, if I'm not mistaken, in the Groot you have nothing. It does, I don't think you will even find the word encyclical in the treaty. Okay, because it's written in, what, 18... I forgot, but it's at the end of... Uh, oh, no, 1906. So it's not that old, but 1906, he could already have spoken about it because there were already a lot of encyclicals, but... It takes a long time for theologians to be like, hmm, maybe we should deal with this. <laughs> you know, uh, nobody, <laughs> nobody would dare to to treat it, I suppose. You know, so also the again ecclesiology progressed a lot in the beginning of the 20th century, and all of the uh, theology on the value of the magisterium, all of those things, uh, have developed a lot quite recently, actually. And the same is true for Mariology to some extent. So ecclesiology, Mariology. Uh, have developed a lot about in, in the 20th century. So in any case, uh, okay, so some authors would just not, not speak about it. All right. <laughs> authors, uh, authors content themselves with, with a sweeping oversimplification. And I'm not sure how to say that. Bliefly? Blithely? It means like, like this. All right. <laughs> Blithely. Dismiss all the encyclical as non-infallible pontifical statements. So we would just say, okay, this is not infallible, boom, end of story. A third group of authors, more scientific in their approach to this problem, maintain that these documents contain some infallibly true teachings, uh, doctrines presented as infallible on the authority of the encyclicals themselves. Even within this last mentioned group, however, we find most frequently little detailed explanation of the various norms by which we can recognize infallibly authoritative statements of the Holy Father's ordinary magisterium in his encyclical letter. So here's the status questionis, all right? Th I thought that was important to read, just to know what is happening. Now, they all agree, however, that at least, all theologians agree, that you have to give at least to encyclicals the religious assent of which we have spoken before, because it, it is at least doctrina catholica. Everybody agrees on that. So you have to accept it. But they don't say, is it faith? Is it not faith? Well, you know. So the, that's, this is basically what is explained in uh, the next page. And we can go to various attitudes among uh, the theologians. Uh, so he gives a list, and you see that he did his research. <laughs> Look at the next page. <laughs> There's a lot of references. So, um, the first one is what? An astonishingly large number of prominent theologians can be found among those who take no adequate cognizance of the encyclical letters in their treatises on uh, papal infallibility. They just don't speak about it. So, for example, he, he refers Mazzella, uh, Doni, Zubizarreta, Mazzella again. It's not the same Mazzella, but okay. Derbigny, Le Boucher, Berry, Sylvester Berry, Herter, uh, Hunter, Tepe, or Tepe, I don't know how to say that. Chersia, I'm not sure how to say that either. Prevel, Casanova, Gerard Paris. Uh, Gerard Paris is a very good Dominican, actually. He wrote the... Uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's the one that wrote like the, the summary of the Summa with the uh, the little... It's good for studies in the sense that you have uh, the main points of each article. Anyway, as a group, these writers frequently give the impression that they consider only those truths proposed by the Holy Father, Solemni Judicio, as infallibly defined, to the exclusion of those truths which he set forth ordinario et universali magisterio. So they don't speak about his ordinary magisterium at all. Another very imposing group of theologians explicitly list the papal encyclicals, at least in a general way, as non-infallible documents. And here you have Felder, Manzoni, Dorsch, Schultz. But we saw that Schultz, although, however, made a, he did say, for example, that Pascendi was infallible. So, you know, he made a few exceptions, I suppose. Antonio Velico, uh, I don't know who. Uh, Lercher, so we spoke about him recently, 
Uh, Graham and others. Fire Mangeno as well. Um, Fire Chopin, we have it here. He's in it, he gives a very, uh, I guess maybe somebody took it for reading. It used to be around. Oh, here. So he makes a, a good analysis of the different kinds of documents coming from the Holy See and all of this. So it's still a very valuable work, but he would just say, well, not infallible. But he would say, however, with Franzelin, that it's you have infallible safety. Uh, Father Thomas Pegg, uh, in his frequently quoted article in the Revue Thomist, which uh, I have given you actually excerpts in the notes, and I have the whole French also, if somebody wants it, just ask me, okay? Uh, then Canon George Smith, who is a uh, nobody and a weak canonist, according to some people, uh, in his brilliant study on this subject. Okay, so. Then you have uh, Benvel, who is there as well, so he will just stay the same, classify them as non-infallible. Um, Dickman classifies the doctrine contained in paper and cyclicals with that of the Roman congregations, as many do. So... Uh, We distinguish, well, I guess we will have to go. But actually, the Grutz uh, spoke about encyclical, so I, I take back what I said. He does speak about it. Uh, but puts it as non-infallible, all right? So, but we will uh, come back on that tomorrow.